So welcome, um, an elite uh, audience uh, in the auditorium. Thank you for coming. Um, and welcome to um, everybody who's online. I'm just going to wait for the thumbs up and uh, we're ready to go. OK, so um, we've got quite a lot to pack in tonight. Um, we've gone for a rather ambitious um, double topic. Um, so we're going to start off with environmental emergencies. So basically hot and cold. Um, and then we're going to transition into um, acute behavioural disturbance and um, some of the uh, important issues around uh, dealing with these, this group of patients. But let's start off uh, with environmental emergencies. So what I'd like to think about, um, probably topical for this time of year, but looking forward hopefully to summer, um, are these two groups of patients. Um, so very cold patients, so essentially hypothermia, and a group of patients who exert themselves typically on hot days and then collapse. So very, very much groups of patients that we uh, as pre-hospital care providers uh, could be sent to and we could go to tomorrow to the hypothermic patient or in a few weeks time um, in the collapsed exertional uh, patient. So we'll just start off very briefly just recapping some of the important physiology around how humans deal with heat. So we're homeostatic creatures, which means that we maintain our body temperature within a range. And that range happens to be between 35 and 37 degrees. So that's situation normal, that's ops normal, that the normal body temperature, a balance of heat production and heat loss maintains a temperature of around 35 to 37 degrees. So it's a constant balance between heat generation through various mechanisms, which we'll talk about, and heat loss. And understanding this actually forms the key to how we're going to approach these patients and some of our treatment strategies, both in terms of prevention and active heat generation. So in general, on the side of the equation of heat generation are two things. Metabolic processes, so the basal metabolic rate, all of those chemical reactions that are going on in the cells throughout the body are generating a low level of heat, which is providing the majority of our heat production within the human body. That was odd. Um, in addition, when we're walking around, we're activating those big muscle groups and that muscular activity above and beyond that basal metabolic rate of just us sitting there quietly um, also generates some additional heat. So we can start to think about that sort of basal metabolic rate and increases and decreases in that metabolic rate, changing the balance of heat production versus heat loss. And we can think about that heavy exertion using those big muscle groups and why that might generate more heat, which has to be balanced by the heat loss. External sources, so unlike some of the, um, the animal kingdom, the other animal kingdom, external sources for us aren't a huge factor in maintaining homeostasis. So we don't need to sit on a rock underneath direct sunlight all day. That's not a key part of our homeostatic mechanisms. In terms of heat loss then, back to your GCSE physics, you're essentially looking at these forms of heat loss, conduction, convection, radiation, and you can see evaporation there as well, 30% of our, our heat loss. So all of these mechanisms are losing heat or have the potential to lose heat, which is being generated by those metabolic processes um, and the muscle activity that we've been talking about. So it really is a balancing act between the heat generation on the left-hand side of the screen there and the heat loss on the right-hand side. And what I try to do here is flip it back into something that is relatable to us, so clinical uh, physiology at work. So if you're cold and you need to generate heat, the only things you can really do as a homeostatic being is to activate those big muscles, which is why jumping up and down, which is why shivering is one of the early responses to uh, requiring heat generation or um, offsetting heat loss. We have very limited ability to on demand increase our metabolic processes. So we can't sit here and go, I'm feeling a bit cold, I'm going to increase my basal metabolic rate, more chemical reactions going, therefore more heat generation. We just can't do that. Some drugs that you see people taking, either um, 
illicit drugs or drugs that we prescribe can increase those metabolic processes, uh, which again begins to explain some of those presentations of patients who are very hot, uh, malignant hyperpyrexia, excited delirium. That's an increase, an exogenous increase in the metabolic processes. And I suppose that I said that we're not really reliant on uh, gaining heat from the environment, but we can go and sit in the sun, we can go and turn the, the heaters on and generate heat from the environment. But actually, those processes are a little bit more about preventing heat loss. So moving on to the heat loss side of things then. So conduction is that direct um, interaction between the body and something that you're going to lose heat into down a heat gradient. So body hot, thing that you're sitting on is cold, you will equilibrate between the coldness and the heat of your body. And you can imagine in the pre-hospital world, we do quite a lot of things to increase heat loss, um, almost inadvertently uh, from our patients. We cut people's clothes off. Uh, we make people go from standing up where they've got a very small body surface area in contact with the floor to having half of their body in contact with something cold like a metal scoop or the floor um, or anything else that, that's colder than, than the body. Convection is that movement of air across the body, taking hot air away and replacing it with cold air. So again, generating that uh, temperature gradient. And this is where wind chill factor comes in. So we all know that on a, a day like today, where it was about between eight and 10 degrees, it actually felt much colder because of the high wind. And that's wind chill increasing our heat loss through convection. So wind chill can really be an issue for us in pre-hospital care, can't it? Because if we have the air conditioning on in the back of the ambulance, we've got wind chill across our patients who we've just taken their clothes off. If they're outside and they're exposed, that wind chill is adding to their heat loss. We all know about uh, people who get wet or fall in water. Um, one of the key parts of maintaining their um, uh, heat homeostasis is to get rid of those wet clothes. Part of that is around the conduction loss into those cold wet clothes, but part of it is about increasing that evaporation because you've now got a wet layer on the top of your surface. And radiation, which is the final form of heat loss, is around having Radi radiative loss of heat into the into the atmosphere, uh, which is in combination with conduction and convection. But the things here that we think about clinically are vasodilatation. So one of the first things you'll see in hypothermia is vasoconstriction to try and divert blood flow away from the body surface area to reduce that radiative heat loss. If we give anesthetic drugs or other drugs that cause vasodilatation, or if the patient has taken um, illicit drugs that cause vasodilatation, um, you have increased losses, heat losses through radiative heat loss. So just for some simple physics, we can start to piece together why our patients are getting cold and how we can help them get warm again, or at least prevent further heat loss. So let's move into the, the nuts and bolts of hypothermia then. So let's start with some definitions. And it sounds quite simple, mild, moderate, and severe. There's some temperature ranges there, 32 to 35 for mild, moderate, 28 to 32, and severe, less than 28. But actually, in practical terms, it's not that simple, is it, in the pre-hospital setting? Because this is related to the core temperature, not the peripheral temperature. And I don't think there are many pre-hospital providers out there outside of some of the uh, enhanced care and HEMS teams who have the uh, genuine ability to measure core temperature in the pre-hospital setting. So it takes us on to using that tympanic thermometer, so using the infrared uh, tympanic thermometer um, to try and work out whether or not our patients are in these temperature ranges. And there's some evidence out there, there are some studies out there that do show a correlation between core temperature and tympanic readings. And in particular, when you use it to measure trends. So if you're using your, if you have a, a time zero tympanic temperature and you intervene to try and heat the patient up or to prevent heat loss, there's some evidence that says that you can use that trend of tympanic uh, temperatures to guide what you're doing and to, to measure success or or otherwise. You have to be careful about the range of your machines. So uh, some of the tympanic thermometers that are in use in the ambulance service go down to about 34 and below that they just say low. So that's pretty unhelpful in terms of our definition of what hypothermia is. 
because if it says low, that doesn't really help you because you could actually be in the middle of mild hypothermia or you can be in moderate and severe hypothermia. So perhaps not that useful. Even if we do have means to measure core temperature, there are two, in general, there are two means of measuring uh, core temperature. One is an esophageal temperature probe and the other is a rectal temperature probe. And those in itself uh, present problems. Esophageal temperature probes, you tend to have to have an anaesthetized patient um, because it's a, it's a fairly invasive thing to do. Um, you can put it in, but it's not terribly pleasant. Um, and there are various other practicality uh, issues with obtaining a core temperature in the pre-hospital environment. So that takes us into trying to correlate what the number on the thermometer actually means. How can we correlate it clinically? Which moves us on to uh, the so-called Swiss staging system, which really was a system that was designed recognizing that the difficulties or recognizing the difficulties of gaining the temperature uh, accurately in the pre-hospital setting and trying to match those temperature ranges that we talked about into what the patient in front of you actually looks like. So in the Swiss staging system, hypothermia stage one, two, three, and four correlate to those mild, moderate, and severe, um, essentially those mild, moderate, and severe categories. So in the first instance, and this is about the physiology of what people do when they get cold and when they try and warm up using those mechanisms that we've, we've talked about briefly. So in stage one, the patient is conscious, they're talking to you, but they're shivering. And I think we've all seen this patient uh, on the side of a rugby pitch uh, or, you know, outside somewhere where they're talking to you and their teeth are chattering and they're shivering. That's probably a, a HT1 or a Swiss staging system one hypothermia, which correlates to that mild to moderate hypothermia um, in terms of the temperature range. As you progress through the stages, you become impaired in your consciousness and you begin to, you begin to stop shivering. That doesn't quite make grammatical sense, but you stop shivering. So you lose that shivering reflex. That's Swiss stage two. Swiss stage three is when they progress to unconsciousness. They're still not shivering, but they have palpable pulses and vital signs. So you can measure signs of life. And then essentially um, in category four, no clinical uh, signs of life. So no vital signs. So notice it doesn't say cardiac arrest, uh, but you can't detect those vital signs for whatever reason. And that corresponds to that very severe hypothermia. So that's probably a better thing to have in your head about picturing the patient in front of you and picturing whether or not they're mild, moderate or severe than worrying too much about a number that may not be accurate in the pre-hospital setting anyway. So shivering is actually quite a, a good thing. So who are the patients that you'll see? Well, you might see the homeless patient who's um, uh, exposed to the environment uh, outside for long periods of time. Uh, you might see, particularly at this time of year, the elderly patient that's fallen in the middle of the night. Most home heating systems are set to be off during the, um, uh, during the night time, so you get a very cold house, you get a frail elderly patient who's fallen over at 1am, 2am, and they're found by the carers at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock the next morning, having been on the floor all night, perhaps with no cover because they're in their pyjamas. They've got that conductive heat loss, they've got the evaporative heat loss, they've got the radiative heat loss going on. And I think we've all come across these patients um, who have had a long lie and they have these various medical comorbidities, but they're quite often um, at least moderately hypothermic. We see patients who have drowned. So we see patients who have tried to walk across ponds and gone into the water um, and have um, a combination of hypothermia and drowning, um, plus or minus cardiac arrest. And I think that pretty much everybody in the room or everybody watching will have had some kind of experience either in the pre-hospital setting or in the hospital setting of these types of patients. So do have a think about the patients that you've been to and think about what they looked like in front of you and try and just put in your mind where they were in that clinical staging system. Were they shivering? Could you not quite work out why they were cold but not shivering? Perhaps that starts to crystallise the picture of the patient that you'll be seeing in future. So when I think about these patients, I find it easier, I think, to think about them in 
very broadly two groups of patients. The patients who are in cardiac arrest and are hypothermic, and the patients who aren't in cardiac arrest. So they're those Swiss staging uh, system patients, one, two, and three, certainly, possibly four. I'm not going to talk um, much about trauma, but I will just say that we've talked about 35 being the cutoff as temperature for a definition of hypothermia. For trauma patients, actually 36 is a, is a real line in the sand to have in your head. So across all causes of mortality and trauma, if patients have a arrival at ED temperature of less than 36 degrees, their probability of dying increases. Below 32 degrees, so it's patients, trauma patients who are who have major trauma, ISS greater than 15, who arrive at hospital with a temperature below 32 degrees are almost certainly going to die. So that's quite different to the group of patients that are the medical patients who might tolerate much lower temperatures for longer. Trauma and temperature doesn't mix. So let's take those two broad groups, cardiac arrest and not cardiac arrest. So hypothermic patients in cardiac arrest then, um, what's the scale of the problem? Well, about 200 deaths a year in the UK. Uh, we're fairly, believe it or not, uh, temperate climate. Um, most deaths actually are associated with patients who also have underlying chronic medical problems. And again, I suspect that that matches your clinical experience of the old lady who's fallen over, laid on the floor all night, has become hypothermic, but also has those multiple uh, cardiorespiratory or other problems as well. 10% overall mortality suggests that actually there's some really good survivability with the younger patients without those comorbidities. In general, primary hypothermia, which we'll talk about in a minute, uh, has the best prognosis. Uh, as long as there's no major trauma, which we've talked about, uh, there's no preceding hypoxia, so around this is around drowning, and there's no severe underlying disease. Uh, and cases related to getting drunk, falling over and being exposed, um, for some reason, I'm not quite sure why, seems to have a, a reasonable prognosis. So actually, quite a lot of positives about this diagnosis of hypothermia. I mean, we can do something about and something that the, for which the prognosis is, is actually quite good. So hypothermic patients in cardiac arrest are most likely to be down in the moderate and severe group if the cardiac arrest has been caused primarily by the, um, by the hypothermia itself. So when I see the hypothermic patient who's cold and in cardiac arrest, that's the clinical presentation, I ask myself two questions. Is the hypothermia primary or secondary? And should I start resuscitation? And let's just deal with those two questions. So does it matter whether or not the hypothermia is primary or secondary? Well, in some regards, no, it doesn't, because they require warming anyway. So it doesn't matter whether they've gone into cardiac arrest and then their metabolic processes have stopped, so there's no heat production on that side of the cycle, and or their heat loss has gone up because they now have exposure as well. It doesn't matter if that's the, uh, the sequence of events or whether or not they've become cold for whatever reason and gone into cardiac arrest secondary to, um, to the hypothermia because the bottom line is they both need to be warmed up. Why it matters probably is because the secondary hypothermias, you have to also address whatever's put them into cardiac arrest in the first place. So if they've had an MI gone into cardiac arrest, you have to address the coronary artery disease that's caused the MI. If they've had an asthmatic arrest, you have to address the bronchoconstriction that's put them into um, cardiac arrest in the first place. And the hypothermia is secondary to the cardiac arrest itself. For the primary hypothermic patients, that's probably quite useful to know as well, because we've already said that the prognosis is quite good. So if you treat these patients aggressively and they've got no underlying medical problems, no none of these multiple comorbidities, they're fairly young, possibly uh, related to alcohol, Actually, you can treat these patients very aggressively and differently uh, in terms of prognostication to uh, other patients who are in cardiac arrest. So that's the first question. The next question is around when you can withhold 
resuscitation. And this is in some ways worthy of just thinking about because there's a lot of talk and I think anecdotally and from your clinical readings around you know the patient's not dead until they're warm and dead um, prolonged resuscitation in cardiac arrest uh, in, in the context of hypothermia and all of that is absolutely right but it doesn't mean that some of the prognostic factors and some of the decision making isn't the same for patients regardless of their temperature I would point out that fixed dilated pupils in the context of hypothermia is not a prognostic indicator. So patients who are profoundly hypothermic can still have fixed and dilated pupils. Um, and we've certainly seen that uh, in the context of other causes of cardiac arrest. So I certainly wouldn't be using the pupils to uh, dictate whether or not I commenced resuscitation attempts. I might use it further down the line as a prognostic indicator in certain circumstances, but I wouldn't say the pupils are fixed and dilated and therefore on the basis of that alone, I'm not starting. If you have obvious exposed gray matter in the same way that that's a indication for potentially not starting um, resuscitation in the first place in other patients who aren't cold then similarly that translates across you're not going to automatically save the life of this patient with gray matter all over the place uh, just because you warm them up so you can use that as a reasonable um, uh, explanation for not starting resuscitation, particularly in the context of a patient who's profoundly hypothermic. We already know that below 32 degrees in trauma, in traumatic causes, um, that patient is incredibly unlikely to survive anyway. So exposed, lots of grey matter, probably reasonable not to commence resuscitation. And of course, the other the other things that we think about as well, the dependent lividity, uh, the rigor mortis, uh, the obvious incompatible with life issues around de de decapitation, hemicorporectomies. This is, a, this is in the literature. So if the chest wall is genuinely too stiff to compress and you're not going to be able to provide effective uh, chest compressions, then that is a reason not to uh, commence resuscitation. Um, Again, I would caution around uh, translating that into more modern practice where we have access to mechanical chest compression devices. Um, I think that's probably a, a suck it and see situation. I think what they're thinking about here is the encased in ice, absolutely frozen solid patient who isn't going to survive anyway. I don't think it's somebody, anyone who's tried to do CPR on a hypothermic patient, even with temperatures of in the high 20s, the chest does feel stiff, uh, but it's not absolutely too stiff to compress. Worth pointing out, if you had access to the core temperature, a core temperature of 12 uh, is accepted as a temperature uh, beyond which uh, survival is uh, not possible. So reasonable to withhold resuscitation with a definite core temperature of 12 degrees or less. That being said, I'll refer you back to all of those issues around gaining a core temperature, uh, not just in the pre-hospital environment, but also in the hospital environment. The current lowest temperature uh, in the literature from which successful resuscitation and rewarming um, have been achieved is about 14 degrees. Uh, just to note, obviously not for uh, East Anglia, um, but for our, uh, any, anyone watching overseas, um, there's some, oddly enough, the only thing that's in the literature about absolute prognostication um, is around uh, avalanche burials. So there's these issues here, uh, which are prognosticating factors. Um, patients who are um, buried for less than 35 minutes or have a core temperature when you find them of greater than 32, or if they've had longer than 35 minutes and a core temperature of less than 32 without snow packed in the airway, um, they have actually reasonable chances of survival. Um, and that is the brother of the King of the Netherlands who was um, buried in an avalanche, um, who was rescued, resuscitated, uh, but died some time later from complications. So other issues and challenges within uh, cardiac arrest then, we're still in the hypothermic cardiac arrest um, arm of this uh, discussion. It can be incredibly difficult to feel a pulse. Um, it's quite difficult to feel for a pulse at the best of times in cardiac arrest. 
primarily because of the difficulties of feeling for the absence of something. You're never quite sure whether or not it's just that it's not there or whether or not you haven't found it or it's too weak. But in hypothermic patients, it genuinely is quite difficult to feel a pulse, primarily around the compliance of the soft tissues over the top of where you're trying to feel for the pulse, but also because it might be profoundly bradycardic. We've talked about it being difficult or impossible to compress the chest, uh, and the Lucas is probably going to be better, or the, the Autopulse, the other mechanical chest compression devices are probably going to help you with that. We've talked about some of the challenges around prognostication and how things can be quite different. So, for example, um, we all know that in most causes of cardiac arrest, about 20 minutes is the point at which if you're still in asystole and your end tidal CO2 is less than two kilopascals, the chances of, of actually having a successful outcome there are vanishingly small. And we often use that uh, as part of our prognostic decision making, particularly if you have access to point of care testing and a pH that is also profoundly acidemic. But in hypothermic patients, those bets are off. 20 minutes is no longer the window. Uh, we've had extensive uh, case reports in the literature of hours and hours and hours of ongoing uh, mechanical chest compression and successful outcomes. So I think you have to go into a different mindset when you're res resuscitating these patients. Triage decisions we'll talk about in a minute because again, we're starting to get a bit cleverer uh, in general about triaging our cardiac arrest patients. And we're not just running to the nearest hospital with chest compressions ongoing. We're thinking about, do we need to go to a specialist center? Do we need to go to a neurosurgical center? Do we need to go to a heart attack center? Again, we probably have to uh, change our triage decisions on the basis of what we think needs to happen next and whether or not the hospital that we want to go to can provide that. And we'll talk about that in just a minute. You'll all be aware of the um, section at the end of the ALS manual um, around cardiac arrest in special circumstances. Um, summary of the changes to your approach to these patients. Patients who are in hypothermic cardiac arrest, um, you will have up to three attempts at defibrillation um, and then you won't have any further attempts. You'll just concentrate on high quality prolonged chest compressions um, and no adrenaline uh, or other drugs for that matter uh, are given until the temperature reaches 30. And again, there are some issues around that in the pre-hospital environment around what is, what's an accurate temperature? Um, how can we get an accurate temperature of 30? But essentially because the uh, drug metabolism is so decreased, uh, patients um, who are hypothermic have so little um, drug activity or potential for drug activity that you can then, as they warm up, suddenly reach toxic levels very quickly because they've been built up and they all hit in at once. Yes, until they're warm. So three attempts at defibrillation until they're warm. Um, so once you get to a temperature of 30, again, similarly because of those metabolic decreases and the potential for toxic levels of uh, adrenaline, between 30 and 35 will double the interval. So instead of giving them every second uh, cycle, you'd give them every fourth cycle. So every six to eight minutes, something like that. And we've touched on a couple of times why prolonged CPR is important. Well, think about that balancing act between your metabolic rate and your heat loss. Your metabolic rate when you get cold goes right down, which by definition means that the amount of oxygen that you need to keep your cells alive also goes down because the metabolic rate has, has reduced. So for example, at 28 degrees, your brain oxygen consumption is reduced by over 60%, maybe up to 80%, which means that instead of being able to tolerate three or four minutes of low flow or zero throat to the brain, you might be able to tolerate up to 30 minutes, which means also that things like, was this a witness to rest or how long did you not have CPR for before we arrived, suddenly become less important than they do in patients who are normothermic. And certainly, as I keep saying, there are many cases of full neurological recovery in the literature uh, with very, very profoundly low core temperatures and several hours of cardiac arrest uh, that, with support to um, 
uh, the circulatory system one way or another. So just to pull those things together then, I think some practical take-home take points here around cardiac arrest, which is mostly related to hypothermia, accepting that there will be a degree of secondary hypothermia in uh, all cardiac arrests. It's probably useful to think about other methods of assessing for your pulse and thinking about signs of life, and many people are now using ultrasound uh, to identify flow or motion in, uh, in impalpable, otherwise impalpable pulses. ALS, start it, unless there are very obvious reasons not to, and then <coughs> modify your adrenaline in your defibrillation strategy. I think a mechanical CPR device, both in terms of the longevity of the resuscitation effort and the, the difficulty compressing the chest wall is going to be important. Preventing further heat loss clearly is important because there's no point in trying to heat people up if they're losing heat on the other end of that balancing act as well. So we need to be thinking about preventing further heat loss, which we'll come on to. And then the triage decision, um, which we'll move on to now, is about where can we get this patient quickly rewarmed? And the literature, if you look, about a 50% survival advantage with extracorporeal warming. And we'll talk about what that means in just a minute. So actually, your triage decision could be one of the most crucial decisions that you make for this group of patients. So let's think now about warming in general. So warming will remember your balancing act, heat generation versus heat loss. Preventing further heat loss is probably number one. Rewarming strategies are where we as doctors, we as clinicians can, can have a, um, a key treatment effect. And they're all based around those conduction, convection, radiation, evaporation uh, principles that we all learned about in physics. So in general, we can classify them as uh, non-invasive, moderately invasive or invasive, with non-invasive methods being passive methods and the invasive methods being active methods. We can also uh, classify them in terms of the speed of rewarming. So slow methods of rewarming, about one degree an hour. So let's think of a patient who is at 28 degrees and we want to rewarm them up to at least 32, maybe 35. That's four degrees. So that's at least four hours for any of these methods to take that, to even theoretically take that temperature up um, to where it should be. So we talk a lot about warm intravenous fluid um, heated up to 45 degrees, which is a standard uh, warm intravenous fluid, pretty useless at raising your temperature. So at least four hours just to go up by a degree um, and think about volume overload there as well and, and what's required to, to increase that um, uh, body temperature up. Heated humidified oxygen, so if you actually are able to heat the, um, uh, the oxygen that you're giving, uh, giving um, and add some humidity to it, that prevents your evaporative heat losses from within the gas exchange parts of your lungs. Um, and probably a degree an hour maybe, um, if you give it either peripherally or through an ET tube. Uh, I'm just putting warm blankets on. Of course, this is when the blankets are still warm and they haven't equilibrated. Um, again, about a degree an hour. So these things are useful probably, but they're not the answer to these patients who are in cardiac arrest. Just in terms of a comparison there, our shivering reflexes will probably generate about the same sort of um, uh, method of uh, speed of warming. So we're now into um, some other passive uh, methods and now some uh, moderately invasive methods. So this is uh, moderate rewarming, two deg three degrees an hour, uh, forced air rewarming devices like the bear hugger, which you'll probably see in the hospitals. That's that um, perforated uh, sheet that goes over the top of you that has hot air uh, blown around you. And really that's around your um, convective heat losses, uh, reducing your convective heat losses by putting a layer of hot air around you so you're not losing um, uh, heat down that uh, heat gradient. Putting an NG tube down or an OG tube down and washing the stomach out continuously with warm um, uh, fluid, warm saline, uh, 
might increase your temperature by a, a moderate amount. And if you increase your uh, temperature of your intravenous fluid to 65 degrees rather than 45 degrees, again, you might increase your, uh, your rewarming. But still not great. So again, that patient who's at 28 that needs to be up to 34, 32, 34, 35, you've got at least a couple of hours um, in the best case scenario of resuscitating that patient to get their temperature up to where you want to be. So really where we want to be is in this rapid rewarming phase. And ideally, cardiopulmonary bypass. Look at the temperature increase that's potential there. So cardiopulmonary bypass, take blood out, warm it up externally, put it back in already warmed up. No need to do anything invasive uh, and wash out with fluid that's going to get cold again. You've got this particularly um, efficient mechanism of heating um, blood as it comes out of the body and put it back in at the right temperature. And you can essentially get your patient up within, within less than an hour to where you need to be. ECMO hemodialysis, one to four degrees an hour, um, not as good, um, but obviously the advantage that you're then supporting the circulation as well and providing some extracorporeal oxygenation to that patient who you're warming up concurrently. So on the other side of that, we've talked about this already, our conduction, convection, evaporation and radiation uh, heat losses, we can inadvertently, whilst trying to fix the patient, whilst trying to treat the patient, be making the hypothermia much, much worse. Evaporation from open body cavities, we've all seen that, I think, uh, those of us who work in the hospital have seen that in the operating theatre where temperature goes down when you've got an open body cavity. Just giving a pre-hospital anaesthetic will drop your temperature by about a degree, independent of anything else that's going on, primarily because of the radiation losses from vasodilatation. So this picture here is a fairly common cardiac arrest in the pre-hospital environment. You know, you've got a pre-hospital team trying to intubate a patient on a scoop uh, with their clothes off because you've had to get the pads on. Uh, you're about to give them an anaesthetic. You might have given them some anaesthetic drugs that have vasodilated them. So inadvertently, this patient, even if that scene time is fairly short, 20, 30 minutes, inadvertently, that patient is getting cold. And we have to think about that and be aware of that and mitigate that as best we can. And there's really that differentiation between rewarming a patient versus preventing them from getting any colder. And we talk about putting blankets on and warming the patient up, but we're not warming the patient up by putting blankets on. We're probably not even warming the patient up by turning the heater on in the back of the ambulance. What we're doing there is we're controlling their heat and preventing further heat loss. We're not actively rewarming them unless you happen to have a couple of um, commercial products like the Blizzard Blanket with the integrated heat pads within it, which does actually generate some heat uh, through various mechanisms. Similarly, when you get to the hospital, you'll have something like this. We went through a phase um, a few years ago of wrapping patients, wrapping trauma patients, particularly in bubble wrap, again, to prevent that uh, radiative and evaporative heat loss. Um, I think this is probably uh, more in widespread use now, the blizzard blanket. But a note just to say that the blizzard blanket on its own will just prevent further heat loss. It won't actively generate heat. In order to do that, you have to put the, the ready heat blankets on as well. Um, and I think it's probably out there now that direct contact of these ready heat style devices, um, any of the quick warming blankets with the, the chemical reactions can genuinely increase the, uh, the risk of surface contact burns. So a nice layer of uh, an ambulance blanket in between the skin uh, and the, the ready heat is, is super important for these patients. This is a fairly superficial burn. Um, I've seen the pictures of the much deeper burns associated with prolonged contact. So actually, speed of how fast you should rewarm should be something that's going through your mind um, when you're triaging these patients. And I suppose the first thing to say is this is about this, you're not dead until you're uh, warm and dead. Um, primarily, the patient needs to have a temperature, a core temperature of above 32 degrees in order for you to confidently say this patient is going to die or is dead. 
there's the literature isn't that helpful but there's a signal towards worse outcomes if you aim for slower rewarming probably related to the efficacy of the actual cardiac arrest um, uh, perfusion itself so if you're on a lucas for four hours whilst you're rewarming it's probably the reduced efficiency that is associated with not having rosc that's related to that trend towards worse outcomes so what it shakes out as is rewarm as rapidly as possible to, to at least 32 degrees and ideally to more like 34 or 35 degrees to give your patients the best uh, chance and you've now seen the numbers as to what means slow, what means moderate, and what means fast. So whether or not you choose ECMO, cardiopulmonary uh, bypass, um, hemo um, uh, dialysis um, as your rapid rewarming strategy depends on the risk benefit ratio and what's available within your system. So I'm not advocating taking a patient 120 miles away just so that they've got access to a center with cardiopulmonary bypass but actually diverting an extra 10 minutes to, to a center that has a designated pathway for hypothermic patients to put them on bypass or put them on ECMO um, actually is something that systems should start to think about building in. And you out there need to know where you can have access to those, um, uh, those rapid rewarming techniques within your own systems and commission pathways. Um, you might have heard of uh, rescue collapse. So this is the patient that um, a couple of things can happen. So movement of a severely hypothermic patient who isn't in cardiac arrest uh, precipitates a cardiac arrest. So that's a patient that's been lying on the floor, lying on the ground, um, and you move them and you're a bit too rough with them. Um, that patient can go into cardiac arrest um, because the heart, you have myocardial uh, irritability because it's so cold and probably acidotic as well. Uh, patients who have drowned um, will have hydrostatic pressure around them. And once that hydrostatic pressure is released, you can get a, a dump of blood pressure because of the diversion of, um, of uh, your circulating volume to the periphery that has been, um, that has been compressed hydrostatically. Um, and of course, the acidosis and the hypothermia and the ability to restart a heart in the context of those two things. Quick note on the ECG, the ECG can be useful. So um, eagle eyed people uh, will be able to see that that looks like a funny QRS complex. The little upstroke, the little hump after the spike of the QRS complex uh, is a J wave or an Osborne wave. Um, and they occur um, in hypothermia and they're almost exclusively related to hypothermia. So it's helpful in terms of, has this patient got an underlying issue so is there an MI on the ECG? And just be careful not to mistake that for ST elevation. You can see, um, if you look quite closely, everything's a bit low voltage. So the P wave and the uh, T wave are quite low voltage. But if you look at the rhythm strip at the bottom, you can see there's a very clear uh, ST segment quite a long way further away from the QRS complex. So don't mistake the J waves for the QRS complex and remember that, uh, so for the T wave, uh, the ST segment, and remember that the T wave itself can be quite low amplitude. Um, again, from a prognostication point of view, if you see this on your ECG uh, in a patient who's in cardiac arrest, primarily secondary to hypothermia, um, the hypothermia-related ECG changes in themselves um, tend to have a, a prognostic um, value to them in terms of a better prognosis. So let's just square away then uh, the practical approach of um, hypothermia without cardiac arrest. And these are moderate and severe cases uh, that I'm talking about primarily. Uh, move them with care uh, because you might convert that patient who isn't in cardiac arrest into a patient who's in cardiac arrest. Um, minimize your invasive interventions for the same reason. Prevent further heat loss. And if you do have to do all those things that you saw the HEMS team doing, minimize the seam time uh, and try and prevent further heat loss with your blizzard blankets, with your warm environment, cutting off the wet clothes, uh, covering patients up, applying the heated blankets if you can. And then if you can, and if you have access to it within your own system, do consider a patient um, 
taking a patient to a unit that's capable of rapid rewarming, particularly if they're not in cardiac arrest and they have a real risk of going into cardiac arrest. So patients with cardiac instability, so funny looking things on the ECG or on the rhythm strip, persistently low blood pressure, core temperature certainly of less than 28, because actually those patients, if you get to them and you rapidly rewarm them, they're the patients that do really, really well. So if you can do that, if you can do that within the confines of your own system, get those patients to the right hospital. Um, and of course, most, most uh, type 1 emergency departments will be able to do gastric lavages, uh, bladder lavages, thoracic lavages, um, and put some of those forced active rewarming devices on. <coughs> So the take home messages um, for hypothermia then. Primary hypothermia is important to identify because the prognosis can be good and we should be moving heaven and earth to try and get these patients warm quickly through the right system and not let them deteriorate into cardiac arrest. We've talked about moving patients carefully, we've talked about the modifications to ALS and why that's important. I think prolonged resuscitation here should be the, the norm and you have to have a good reason not to have prolonged resuscitation. Think about the usefulness or otherwise of some of the typical prognostic um, indicators that you use. Consider the triage destination and again like every other patient we've got in front of us, what do they need now, what do they need in an hour, what do they need over the next 24 hours and does the hospital that I propose to take the patient to have the capability of providing that care to my patient? Um, and just remember, in all of this, we've been talking quite a lot about this value or that value of the temperature. Remember the absolute limitations of trying to measure the pre-hospital core temperature um, and think about the alternatives like the Swiss staging system. So that concludes the, that concludes the hypothermia section. I want to segue quite quickly. We'll have a little break in a minute um, about the disturbed patient. Um, Let's move on to um, this patient here, the collapsed runner. So we've got, um, in just a few weeks' time in Cambridge, we've got the Cambridge Half Marathon coming up, um, which in itself um, is not um, a stranger to, um, to these patients who collapse. Um, these two are medical students or former medical students. This is about four or five years ago now. Doug on the left there in the dark blue top was one of our founding committee members for this program. Um, they were watching uh, the Cambridge Half Marathon uh, um, a few years ago, saw a runner collapse and got straight on his chest and delivered good quality early CPR until the ambulance service arrived. So this does happen and it happens in the context of just being a spectator in the wrong place at the wrong time, uh, as well as in the context of being um, an emergency services provider. Not so much for the Cambridge Half Marathon, but the London Marathon does have uh, an extensive medical infrastructure set up around it. So um, often delivered by St John Ambulance volunteers, a whole host of volunteer doctors. Um, and what you probably don't know, um, or what you maybe haven't thought about before, is that this is um, horse guards, but at the finish line, both on the north side and on the south side of the Mall, are two big tents that look just like this that are intensive care tents uh, with several beds of full level three intensive care facilities uh, available. And they're staffed by doctors who will quite happily give a pre-hospital anaesthetic at the finish line in that intensive care tent and then the rest of the medical infrastructure will move the patient off to, to an appropriate hospital. So there are infrastructures in place for big events like that and we can talk about some of that in just a minute. So the issues to consider um, are essentially four, four issues. I know it says three, but there are four issues. We're not going to talk about low BM or underlying uh, undiagnosed cardiac disease, but they are two of, the, um, two of the big contributors to this. What I want to focus on in this talk uh, is heat-related collapse, so the opposite of the hypothermic patient that we've been talking about, but also uh, this important um, topic of hyponatremia. Uh, and how we can perhaps tease out the difference between the runner that's collapsed in front of you that has collapsed because of heat, heat exhaustion or heat stroke, uh, and the runner that's collapsed in front of you because of a profound hyponatremia. And they're sometimes quite tricky to, to tell apart. So my experience of working at the London Marathon is that 
when runners finish this race, they look pretty sick anyway. Many runners look absolutely knackered, ill, and if you came across them in a normal, in the context of your normal day's work, you would think they were acutely unwell. It's just the body's endurance. So the patients who collapse, the runners who collapse, get carried over the finish line, have genuine collapses um, on, the, on the course itself, do look really, really sick. And, you know, the, it takes quite a lot to twitch an A&E doctor, but I was quite twitched when I actually saw these patients getting brought into me because they just look like the sickest patient you've seen. But the vast majority of them with some appropriate initial expert treatment will absolutely normalize literally in front of your eyes and get better. So it's actually quite important to get this right. So let's think about the exertional hypothermia in the first instance. Here we are again with the difficulties of pre-hospital definition uh, of this disease. Um, it's defined by core temperature um, and again, practically speaking, most uh, marathons uh, apply a rectal temperature to this, uh, but of over 40 degrees. So all you have to have to get heat stroke as a diagnosis is a rectal temperature of over 40 degrees and be confused or have altered level of consciousness. And the stats will tell you that it'll happen in about one in 10,000 marathon runners, um, which is a similar risk of all cause death with those undiagnosed coronary artery diseases, structural heart diseases, etc. So if you equate that to the 40 to 50,000 runners that are in the London Marathon, you can probably expect in every one of the London marathons that are run, um, sort of dependent a little bit on um, the temperature that uh, the, the temperature of the day itself, but not that much actually. You can expect four or five runners a year to have this profound exertional hypothermia and require immediate emergency treatment in one of those intensive care tents uh, along the course. And that is what we see. So we see that number of patients probably coming through. We see the vast majority of people come in with other things, uh, cramps, um, blisters, um, but we do see um, four or five patients um, uh, potentially on a bad, a bad year with that exertional hypothermia. So what's the treatment and how do we do it? Well, it's actually pretty obvious and pretty basic. You have to cool them down and you have to cool them down fast. So cooling and fanning, so ice packs in the groin, air going across them, increasing that convective and radiative heat loss, uh, reducing that uh, radiative heat loss, sorry, um, is important. There are specific cooling systems that you can get, so basically big ice packs um, that you can put around patients that, again, we've, we used to have in the hospital when we were using targeted um, hypothermia for post-cardiac arrest patients. Um, and we're aiming for a rapid drop in temperature through those systems to at least 38 degrees as quickly as possible. Because the quicker you get the temperature down, the better they do. I've talked about the scope of the problem at the London Marathon in 2012. Um, there was a death from heat stroke at the marathon. Um, and in 2010, uh, two, two patients have been intubated by the teams at the finish line ITU, primarily related to temperature and, uh, and sodium issues. So exertional hypothermia does have a poor prognosis if the initial temperature is more than 41 degrees, if they have a coma for more than two hours, so again, that relates to the speed at which you can cool them, uh, if they have a lactic acidosis or if they have metabolic evidence of rhabdomyolysis, which you probably won't know pre-hospital, or again, if they have evidence of organ failure, primarily kidneys. But I can't emphasize this enough. The duration of the temperature elevation, elevation is crucial. That's why at the finish line at the marathon, that's where the cooling is initiated. We're not scooping and running with these patients. We're not getting them off to the hospital so that the hospital can cool them. We are cooling them in situ. If you delay the therapy, then you're looking at a mortality of 80% or so. If you get immediate cooling with a rapid drop of uh, temperature to at least 38, your mortality goes down to 10%. So that's actually crucial. 
making sure that you're doing it right and doing it fast on scene in situ genuinely helps your patients. So the take home messages for hot runners, so the runner that collapses in front of you and they feel hot, they're burning up, they're 40 degrees. If they've collapsed and they've got confusion, measure their core temperature if you can and initiate cooling straight away. And I would absolutely advocate staying on scene to try and get that temperature down as quickly as possible. If you're nearby a shop, get ice packs from the shop, pack them in ice, all the stuff that you can do on scene. If you can actively get their temperature down on scene, then that's going to be prognostically better for your patients rather than putting them in the back of the ambulance, getting them to the hospital 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes later, hospital running around trying to find some ice or their specific device. You could have had them cooled by then um, if you use some of, the, um, some of the things that are around you when you go to these patients. So that's hot runners. I just want to finish off just uh, four or five slides on sodium. So hyperendotremia is low sodium. And typically what you get here, primarily because um, in the charity style runners or the non-elite runners that haven't thought about this stuff in advance, what you get is this insatiable thirst um, associated with running a marathon. So you take lots of water on board and you're drinking water and water and water, stay hydrated, stay hydrated. And by the time you've got several hours into the race, you've taken on so much water that you've diluted all of the sodium that's in your body. You're not taking in sodium, you're still excreting it, but you've now diluted it with several liters, um, sometimes up to eight or nine liters of water that you've taken on board to try and quench this thirst, to try and get you through this marathon. But what you've done is you've diluted your sodium down and you've dropped your sodium quite quickly from its normal range to a very abnormal range. You'll present with headache, confusion, maybe primarily with a seizure, maybe some vomiting, but effectively what you'll present at is an unwell looking collapsed runner. So your key differential here is differentiating the hot runner that we talked about, that you pack in ice and get their temperature down. You have to differentiate this patient from, from that patient, ideally with a rectal temperature probe. Now, every doctor and um, every um, tent at the London Marathon, every medical tent is issued with a personal rectal thermometer, prized possession in my, um, my medical kit at the moment. Measuring that core temperature making a determination about whether or not that patient is hot is actually quite an important thing to differentiate. 2007, uh, 15 cases of hyponatremia, point of care testing for sodium, 15 cases of dilutional hyponatremia, uh, and it's been associated with at least one death in the last few years. So this is something that we can genuinely make worse. So this is something that through good intentions, we can genuinely make worse. So who's at risk? We've talked about the non-elite runners that, haven't, that need to take more water on and haven't thought about the, um, the isotonicity of the fluid they're taking on board. If there's a runner that's collapsed and they're a bit confused, don't give them a big litre of drink. Don't think they need hydration because they might actually need precisely the opposite of that. It's tempting, isn't it, to see this runner that collapses in front of you, bang a li IV line in and give them some saline. That's probably not the right thing to do for these patients, certainly not blindly. So what I would assess is their hydration status. So are they genuinely hyperdynamic, you know, not shut down, hyperdynamic, full, hypervolemic? Are they hot? We've talked about. And if you have got it, particularly in the context of a setup system, a point of care blood test to know exactly what your sodium is before you treat the patient blindly. And these are the patients that you don't stay on scene with. These are the patients that you get to hospital quickly because that's where the blood test for sodium gets done. That's where you can start to manage the sodium levels um, adequately. That's where you can offset the um, sequelae of the ongoing seizures, airway management, um, intravenous um, um, anti-epileptic medications. So what do we do at the hospital then? And why do I say get to hospital quickly? Well, we'll deal with the raised ICP, we'll deal with the comb, we'll deal with the seizures through various methods, but we do have hypotonic saline that we can give to raise the sodium levels up. And it's absolutely essential to get that 
elevation in sodium right and do it in a controlled manner. So not so much for acute hyponatremia, but as a, as a good rule of thumb for any patient with hyponatremia, be it acute or chronic, it's useful to think about the rule of sixes. So you have to have a very good reason to raise your serum sodium, even in the context of hyponatremia, by more than about six millimoles in the first six hours. And I would always use an online calculator. So this is uh, MD Calc, I suspect. Uh, you put the numbers in, it does all sorts of calculations in the background, and it tells you exactly what fluid to give at exactly what rate. So 61 mils an hour, not 60, not 62, 61 mils an hour is what I would start that as if I was using 3% saline, uh, 122 mils an hour if I was using 3% um, saline to increase by a bit faster, um, and if I was using... 3% uh, saline to increase it by two millimoles instead of half a millimole, I'd double that again. So absolutely um, precise calculations and then continuous monitoring of that rise in blood sodium to make sure that you're not overdoing it. And the risk of overdoing it is profound and irreversible neurological damage called central pontine myelinitis. So they're patients that end up profoundly debilitated because of big osmotic switches um, in their sodium levels. So the take home messages uh, for the collapsed runner then, don't blindly give IV fluid. If you think they've got a low sodium, have extreme caution uh, with sodium replacement and check the temperature and initiate cooling on scene in situ if required. Transfer to hospital immediately particularly for sodium related issues and as soon as you've exhausted your cooling capabilities in the context of hyperthermia. And with that we'll have a little pause. Any questions around the temperature stuff and then we'll just do half an hour on the disturbed patient. Uh, yes I'll repeat the question. Uh, hi, um, so going back to um, hyperthermic patients, um, you noted like the 45 or 65 degree um, saline like increase in temperatures. Obviously in the ambulance service we have bags that carry around at ambient temperature. So just thinking if I came across a patient who was hypovolemic and indicated fluids, how much, is there any literature in how much sort of like that would lower temperature by say today we're using an ambient temperature bag of saline on that patient? Yeah. So I think, um, the take home message from that. So the question was around um, whether or not you can have a um, negative effect or a harmful effect on a patient who is hypothermic, who you also think is hypovolemic by giving them ambient temperature, um, ambulance service uh, saline, essentially. Um, and I think the answer there is the hypovolemia is the issue that you need to correct. So clearly you're guiding your intravenous fluid resuscitation on the basis of blood pressure on the basis of your clinical assessment of their hydration status and the resuscitation volume that they need. For the amount that that will decrease the body temperature, um, it's actually more important to focus on their volume status. So I would crack on and give your usual 250 ml bolus, 500 ml bolus, because it's not going to have a massive effect on the drop in, in uh, body temperature. Even with the 45 degree um, saline warmed up, your rate of increase of body temperature is only about half a, half a degree an hour. So by giving small, focused, resuscitative aliquots of fluid, you're not going to reduce that temperature by a clinically significant amount. Yes? Uh, so you, with like the HEMS cruise, you've got an ice stack and hypotonic saline. Would you consider correcting on scene or would you just let him go? Um, so the question was, um, in the collapsed runner who you think has hyponatremia, who you have a point of care, uh, low sodium and access to hypertonic saline, would you correct it on scene or would you load and go? Um, and I think it depends on the clinical um, presentation of the patient. So if they're in a profound coma, if they have an active seizure ongoing, um, I would give the hypertonic saline, but I would use the calculator, the online calculator to work out how much to raise it by about a millimole just to stop them seizing and then get them into hospital for further careful uh, elevation of their hyponatremia. Because in a hyponatremic seizure, the only thing that's going to stop them seizing is correcting their sodium. Yes. 
or at least increasing their sodium, not correcting it. Good. Okay. Any questions online? Okay. Good. So we'll just have uh, thirty seconds or so, um, and then we'll uh, we'll move on uh, just for half an hour on uh, the disturbed patient. So just talk amongst yourselves. Okay, um, thanks for staying with us. So we'll just move on now just for the last um, half an hour, just uh, as promised, um, to think a little bit about uh, the disturbed patient in front of you. Um, and we'll try and just give you some clinical take home points for, um, you know, if you get this case tomorrow. So I think we're all aware of the general types of disturbed patient um, that we see. I think primarily it's this patient, isn't it? The patient who um, doesn't want to come to hospital. I mean, try taking Mabel to hospital when she doesn't want to go. You've got to be absolutely uh, sure of where you stand legally whilst making those decisions. And patients who might be injured, might have head injuries, um, who might have disturbed behaviour, related to those injuries, we have to have a way of sorting that out as well. Uh, and I think most of us have come across in our daily life um, people who are tricky to manage um, but might not have pathological uh, disturbed behaviour. So why did I want to cover this? Well, my feeling um, from taking advice calls, from speaking to, um, to crews out there, from receiving patients into my emergency department is that when people phone for clinical advice and when people really struggle with, um, with cases that they go to, it's very infrequently the actual clinical decision making, the actual medical ability to do the job, the practical skills. It's quite often around issues of consent, capacity and mental health. Um, and that seems to be a, continuous, a continual challenge. Um, as a quote there from a former medical director of the East of England Ambulance Service, if you speak to almost anybody who takes calls for the ambulance service, they'll say that this is a, you know, one of the number one reasons that they get called for. And it is a big chunk of our workload. So about 10% of our calls um, are related to mental health codes. Um, if you think that in somewhere like the East of England, where we have three or 4,999 calls a day, that's a significant chunk of our workload, two or 300 patients in the East of England who may well have um, a 999 call related to mental health um, disorders. And that's not to say that it isn't the hidden issue in a lot of other calls. So the domestic violence calls, um, some of the other calls that actually turn out to be not as given, they actually turn out to be when you start pulling, pulling at the thread and digging below the surface, there's actually something else going on and you end up having this behavioral disturbance to deal with. So a huge problem in, uh, in the UK and a huge um, challenge for the ambulance service. So what I thought we could probably do is talk about these five things. Um, we'll talk about the relevant legislation. We'll spend quite a bit of time talking about that, including consent, um, because I know everyone loves a good talk on consent, but I think it is quite important to get it right. We'll talk a little bit about how you can start to sort out the different types of patients that are in front of you, so the different types of behavioural emergency. And once you've sorted them out, how you can begin to gain control to start to treat that patient if necessary.
what you can do when things go wrong, and we'll try and apply it as we go along to, uh, to decisions that you, you might have to make. So I think practically speaking, you only really need to know about these two pieces of uh, legislation. The Mental Capacity Act, I think you need to know inside out. And I think you need to know the Mental Health Act, but only tiny little bits of it, not the bits that uh, go on in the hospital. Um, and most of the Mental Health Act that goes on in the hospital is even outside of my department in the emergency department. And I only need to know a little bit more than I need to know in the pre-hospital environment. So let's spend a little bit of time um, on the Mental Capacity Act. It's been around since 2005 now. I think it's fair to say that there isn't a shift that goes by either on the, in the ambulance service um, or in the HEMS environment or in the emergency department setting that doesn't involve um, a patient for whom you think about the Mental Capacity Act. Because it is the basis for all consent and all emergency treatment uh, that we provide. So the two guiding principles that we have to start this conversation with every time is that there's a presumption that if you've achieved the age of 16 years, you have to be assumed to have capacity. So we as medical professionals have to uh, assume that you have capacity to make decisions about your healthcare uh, choices um, until we until you prove otherwise and we have to have a reasonable suspicion that you don't have capacity to even start to question whether or not you have capacity to make a certain decision so that's actually quite important we have to presume that our patient has capacity and the other thing to say is it doesn't have to be a doctor it doesn't have to be a consultant it doesn't have to be a psychiatrist any healthcare professional so any registered healthcare professional a nurse paramedic doctor can make an assessment of capacity so you don't take a patient into hospital for a capacity assessment, which is something I have heard occasionally. So it's a core expectation of what we're expected to do because we can't provide safe, effective treatment that's in our patient's best interests without knowing about consent and capacity. And I think in general, there are two main groups of patients. Unconscious and incapacitated patients are actually the best case scenario for us because we act in their best interests. We act under the Mental Capacity Act, and we'll talk about the limits of what we can, where we can act in, in just a minute. The patients, I think, that generate all of that angst and all of those phone calls to top cover advice is a conscious patient who disagree with the plan that you, you want to enact or disagree with your treatment plan. So, we assume that the patient has capacity. If they give us a reason to test that capacity, if they give us a reason to suspect that they might not have capacity to make the specific decision that we're asking them about, then these are the four tests that we would be expected to apply. So number one, does the patient understand the information? And it's important to note, there's a couple of little caveats to this that all practical steps must be taken to assist so there's no point in explaining it to the patient in long medical terms abbreviations that they can't possibly understand you have to give it to them in a format that they would understand diagrams pictures through an interpreter um, simple terminology can they retain that information so not can they just dictate it back to you word for word what you've just said to them but do they know the salient points have they got the gist of what you're trying to tell them have they understood can they retain it uh, and essentially repeat back the basic bits of what you would expect them to have picked up in order to weigh up their decision which takes you up to can they weigh up the risks and benefits and this is quite a tricky one and this is this is often the gray area that we we use in terms of really getting into the nitty-gritty of assessing capacity. It's a very difficult and subjective assessment as to whether or not they can weigh up risks and benefits because you don't know what's in their head, you don't know what they're thinking about, you don't know what is guiding their, their relative pros and cons decision in their own mind. What is 
certainly true is that this isn't a measure of intelligence. So you can't say, well, I know that you have an IQ of less than 80 and therefore you can't possibly weigh up the risks and benefits of this complex decision. That's not how this works. This is about, can they weigh up what you've said to them appropriately? There's some interesting discussions and it's certainly well outside of the scope of, of this talk around depression. So if somebody has taken an overdose of paracetamol, of whatever other medication we see on a daily basis, with the intention of killing themselves, by definition, you might consider that a depression is clouding their judgment, that everything is totally hopeless. And if you were to treat that depression, it's not entirely unreasonable. And you can create an argument that says, well, the patient might come to a different decision. and might not have quite as clouded assessment of the risks and benefits if you allow us to treat your depression. And that's a very difficult judgment call to make. And that's a judgment call we make fairly frequently in the emergency department around what it means to have profound depression in terms of your capacity to weigh up your risks and benefits. Psychosis, so loss of touch with reality, probably relates to um, uh, less chance that you can weigh up your risks and benefits, but it's absolutely by no means um, for sure. Uh, and then any other distractions. So we've all seen that patient who's just totally distracted by something else and they, you just can't, however much you explain something to them, you, you can see they're just not, they're not taking the information on, they're not able to weigh it up. Um, so I can think of cases of parents um, with very badly injured children, parents who injured themselves, and they're absolutely refusing for you to do anything to them, even though it's clearly in their best interest until you tell them whether or not their son or their daughter is going to be okay. That clearly is affecting that distraction, that extraneous distraction is affecting their ability to weigh up their risks and benefits. So I think you can see and you can probably think about cases that you've been to yourself that yeah, understanding and retaining is actually quite straightforward and can they communicate it back to you, which will come on in a minute. But it's the risks and benefits that you can create an argument one way or another. And I'll just take you back to two things, the principle of acting in patients' best interests, but also the principle of uh, an assumption of capacity um, for patients who are in front of you. So a very difficult decision. And I suspect, and certainly the phone calls that I've received from people when I've been on call uh, have been all around the weighing up of the risks and benefits. It's not about one, two or four. It's not about understanding and retaining. It's about the weighing up. And really that subjective decision about the thing that you've identified that you think might be impairing their ability to weigh up this decision. Is it genuinely enough for you to deprive them temporarily of their liberty, treat them under the Mental Capacity Act against what they're saying their will is. Uh, and again, just a, a note on the caveat of uh, communicating the decision. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, verbal communication. It could be blinking, nodding, signing, writing. It can be any sort of communication, even just withdrawing their arm from you uh, as you go mm. to put a cannula in. That is a communication of their decision. So, not quite as straightforward as perhaps you might first have thought. Let's make it even less straightforward. So what about children? So we've already said that over the age of 16, people are presumed to have capacity. It's the uh, presumption of capacity that's ingrained and enshrined within this law. There's that group of patients, aren't there, that are actually under the age of 18, technically at the age of 16 and 17, you're technically through other statu uh, statutes um, and acts uh, considered to be a child. So that puts us into this slightly tricky conundrum around patients who are under 16 and patients who are 16 to 17, based on this assumption that if you're 16, that's the cutoff that you must have capacity. On your 16th birthday, however, it doesn't automatically follow that the day before you didn't have capacity and the day of your 16th birthday, you do have capacity. In law, it does, but in practical terms, it quite clearly doesn't. There has to be some kind of evolution to that attaining capacity. And we can talk a little bit about that. 
So let's simplify it. Let's say under the age of 16, you're not presumed to have capacity. So consent for procedures and interventions on patients under the age of 16 must be gained from a person with parental responsibility. And it's useful just to remember that um, fathers up until fairly recently didn't have automatic uh, parental responsibility. Mothers do. Fathers essentially have to have one of these things. If they were married to the mother at the time of the birth of the child, even if they're not mentioned on the birth certificate, they still have parental responsibility. If they're not married to the mother at the time of the birth and they're named on the birth certificate, then they have parental responsibility. Or if they're neither of those two things, but they've been subsequently granted responsibility by court um, or through a, what's called a PRA, a parental responsibility agreement, then they have responsibility. So that's actually quite a tricky thing to tease out when you're just there with the patient and dad's with the child and you're trying to get consent. I think it's reasonable to assume that the father that's there has parental responsibility, but just be aware that the automaticity is only um, in certain circumstances. And then you've got this disaster of what happens if the parents disagree. So you're there with a child and you want to perform some kind of um, uh, procedure and the parents disagree. Mum says yes, dad says no, or vice versa. It's worth remembering that the law only requires you to have one person with parental responsibility in order to proceed. But actually, this gets incredibly complex, and I would certainly expect a phone call to either me or uh, your medical legal helpline in this case. These are the type of um, cases that make the news. So what about children then? We talked about that transition from day before 16th birthday to 16th birthday in law. But what if they've achieved that emotional maturity and they can tick all those boxes on your capacity test before they reach the age of 16? Well, we do have something um, that can help us here. For a start, emergency treatment um, can be given without consent. So mm -hmm. that's the same as for everybody else. So as long as you're acting in best interest and the Bolam test talks about what um, a group of your peers would do in that circumstance, um, you can provide emergency treatment. Um, and remember those forms that you have to get your mum and dad to sign before you go on a school trip or you have to sign for your own children? That's essentially a form temporarily devolving parental responsibility to the school um, uh, for the duration of that trip. So that if something happens in an emergency, emergency treatment can be carried out at the say-so of the teacher that's responsible for the class. Um, so you don't have to wait to track down the parents in the case of an emergency. And we've also got um, a bit of law, um, and we talk, I think, in general about Gillick competency. Um, but the two key players in um, the formation of this case law were um, Fraser, uh, Lord Fraser, um, who, whose ruling it was, um, and Gillick, um, who was the activist um, coming up with this law. So primarily the law was around um, oral contraceptive uh, pills. Uh, it was in 1984. Um, and the bottom line was that there was a, a child who was under the age of 16. This is obviously before the Mental Capacity Act uh, was, was redesigned in 2005. But essentially this was around, um, does the doctor have to inform the parents um, of uh, a minor receiving the oral contraceptive um, and what are the issues of consent and capacity around that. And the, the ruling led us to this concept of Gillick competency because Lord Fraser said that in some, and this is almost directly lifted from his uh, judgment, in some circumstances minors can consent to treatment and in these cases the parent cannot overrule the consent. So that was the key part that the minor can consent and the parents cannot overrule that consent. And this has led to this sort of, in inverted commas, Gillick competency. 
So very similar to that four-part Mental Capacity Act uh, assessment, and again, this comes from the original ruling, the child under the age of 16 has to be able to understand the professional's advice. There has to have been an attempt by the healthcare professional to persuade the under 16 child to inform their parents. The healthcare professional who is proposing the treatment needs to be um, fairly convinced that their physical or mental health would likely suffer without the treatment. And critically, and back to that sort of primary uh, directive of, of medicine in general, it has to be in that child's best interest for you to proceed. And then there was this sort of nebulous um, sentence about the child's uh, achieved sufficient understanding and intelligence to understand fully what's proposed. That's basically saying that they would meet the criteria uh, laid out in the Mental Capacity Act. So this idea of the sort of 15 year old who you're trying to get consent for something from meeting this Gillick competency in the absence of parents there to give consent on their behalf um, is actually quite an important one for us again in the emergency department with, with patients that come in without the parents and who sometimes don't want the parents to know that they're there and want to consent to certain treatments um, in the absence of parental consent. But this in itself doesn't come without its own legal challenges. So between the age of 16 and 17, if you think that they don't have capacity to consent, so if they don't have capacity to consent on the basis of those four questions that you've asked, so can they uh, understand, retain, weigh up, uh, communicate their decision, somebody with parental responsibility can consent on their behalf at the age of 16 and 17. So that's that middle ground after the age of 16 but before the age of 18. Over the age of 18, so if you think a 19-year-old doesn't have capacity to consent and their parent is there saying, oh, don't worry, I consent on their behalf, that actually is not consistent with the law because the parent cannot or any other person cannot consent for a person who's over 18. So that becomes trickier in that you have to proceed under the Mental Capacity Act um, and perhaps go down the line of getting court orders if you need to do any um, uh, restri restrictive or more restrictive options. Going back to that under 16 Gillick competent, so giving consent, the key point here, and this is where you have to have it absolutely right in your head, otherwise you get this um, uh, mixed up. If that child who is under 16, who you deem as Gillick competent and meets those criteria that we've just talked about, gives consent, it can't be overruled by the parents. But of course, per those previous guidelines, the doctors also have to think that the action is in the best interest of the child. But the critical corollary of that is refusal of consent can be overruled regardless of whether or not you think that that child has Gillick competency. So just to say that again, you think that a child under the age of 16 has Gillick competence, they can make a decision, they can consent, and the parents cannot overrule that consent. It doesn't work the other way around. If the child refuses consent, then the parents can overrule that decision. But of course, that should say somebody with parental responsibility, not necessarily automatically the father. Okay, let's chuck another spanner in the work. So here is a 14 year old. So you get called to a, um, a shopping center uh, where a 14 year old has been arrested for um, shoplifting. Uh, she's pregnant. She's obviously pregnant, 30 weeks pregnant, um, and also has PV bleeding. Um, they don't want to press charges for the shoplifting uh, and the child is now uh, refusing, the 14 year old is refusing to go to hospital and just says, leave me alone. She understands you, she retains the information, she's quite clearly weighing up um, the pros and cons. You've talked to her about blood loss, you've talked to her about hypovolemic shock, you've talked to her about placental abruption, you've talked to her about uh, potential fetal loss, you've talked about maternal death, she knows all about this, she understands it and she's retaining the information, giving it back to you and she still doesn't want to go to hospital. 
this brings in a whole nother world of pain. And probably you'll be reaching straight away for your phone to phone your top cover advice or to get your medical legal advice. I put a couple of options up here. So she's presumed by law to have capacity. Well, clearly she isn't presumed by law to have capacity because she's not achieved the age of 16. Um, is her behaviour erratic enough to detain her under Section 136 of the Mental Health Act? Probably not. Um, she could have capacity if you assess her on Gillick, and if so, you can't take her to hospital against her will. Well, that may or may not be true, of course, because if there's a parent there, the parent can overrule her consent or withholding of consent. So if her parent is there and they have parent parental responsibility, then perhaps you can take her to hospital against her will because a parent has overruled her. So that would fit quite neatly within what we've just talked about. So if the mother arrives, she can give consent on the child's behalf, possibly. Can the mother give consent over the phone? Well, of course, she doesn't lose her right to parental responsibility just because she's not there in person, she's on the phone, but you'd have to be pretty sure that it's the mother on the phone who you're talking to, both in terms of the confidentiality issues, but also in terms of knowing that you're acting within the law. I would also say that this is a primary guiding principle in a job like this, that actually the Children's Act, both 1989 and 2004, uh, deals with child protection. Um, and one of our key responsibilities as healthcare professionals is to safeguard children. Uh, child welfare is listed as paramount in that, um, in that statutory um, guidance, and we have a duty of care to that child. And it's worth remembering that the age of consent is 16 and that an illegal act must have occurred here because there has been a sexual uh, relationship with a 14 year old um, when the age of consent is 16. So there are all sorts of safeguarding uh, issues here and it probably trumps everything. When it, when it shakes down and you're struggling as to does she have capacity? Doesn't she? Is she Gillick competent? I can't get hold of the mother. I'm not sure whether the father has parental responsibility. Actually, if you act in her best interests, which clinically it clearly is in her best interest to be assessed at the hospital, but you also act under the Children's Act and within your duty of care with safeguarding, you're probably not going to be criticised by that. But that is certainly something that I would be phoning top cover for. And if you phoned me, I would probably pretend that the line had dropped and I'd turn my phone straight off. Okay, so let's move on to um, treating someone without capacity uh, in an emergency. Just another five minutes or so. So if they're moribund, unconscious, that's that first group of patients, so they're now not refusing treatment, you're not having to assess their capacity, they are unconscious and you need to treat them in the emergency. You have to be able to demonstrate that the treatment is immediately necessary to save life or prevent their deterioration. You have to make sure that all of, their, uh, all of those treatments is in their best interest and there's this Boland test of um, you know, a court of your peers and what they would do in the same circumstances. I think it's useful in the context of end of life care, particularly to think about what you know or you are told their past and present wishes were. Um, and this includes their beliefs and values, um, including their religious beliefs um, and any advanced directives um, that are in place or that you believe to be in place. It has to be the least restrictive option. So if you're going to do something to somebody, it has to be the least restrictive option. So you can't do an emergency laparotomy on a patient, stop the bleeding and then go, oh, while well, I'm here, I'll just take the appendix out or I'll just do something else or I'll just do something else. Uh, you have to do the least restrictive option and then wake them up and consent them for any additional procedures that you want to do or continuously make assessments of what the least restrictive option are. Quick note on documentation then. So my bugbear is this patient does not have capacity and that gets written in the notes quite often. I quite often get phone calls to come and assess a patient's capacity. And of course that doesn't actually tell me what somebody's asking me to do. Capacity is decision specific, it's time specific and it's situation specific. So I need to assess the capacity of a patient to make a specific decision about his or her care. 
Um, so it might be that they want to leave the emergency department, it might be that they want to consent for an appendicectomy or a blood transfusion, but I have to know what the specific question I'm asking is. And once I've applied those four tests, this is the sort of thing that I write in my notes. So not just this patient has the capacity to make a decision, I would say something like, despite my best efforts, this patient does not understand the information that I'm providing. He's repetitive, asking the same information over and over again, and I don't think he's retaining that information. I might write something like, her severe depression is impairing her ability to weigh up the information I've provided. And I have to be quite careful with that um, and, and maybe come up with some more evidence around that. She's refusing to communicate with me and therefore she cannot state her wishes to me. And then, because of those things, I therefore judge that she does not have capacity at this point to make this specific decision. So that's the level of note detail that I would expect to see in, in notes of patients who have had an assessment of their capacity for a specific situation. Okay, let's just quickly, uh, I said it was a very short section, the Mental Health Act. Um, you, as clinicians, Effectively, there are no parts of the Mental Health Act that you can use pre-hospital. That's basically the bottom line. But you do need to be aware of sections 135 and 136. And I think the commonest one we come across almost on a daily basis is the use of section 136 by a police officer um, who sees a mental, uh, suspected mental health disorder in a public place and is allowed to transfer that patient to a place of safety in order for them to be further assessed by an approved mental health practitioner and or have their physical or mental health uh, uh, assessed. Section 135 is um, much more um, um, difficult to use. It's again police use only. Um, and it's to allow the police officer to enter someone's house if they believe that the, the patient is suffering a mental health disorder that's uh, um, uh, problematic to their health. And it requires a court order, a warrant. It's not something you'll go on a 999 call to do and deal with at the same time. You might be asked to accompany the police officer who is um, actioning the Section 135 warrant, but it won't be something that you do um, ad hoc um, uh, when you go to these patients. So that's the Mental Health Act. Okay, if you'll permit me just another 10 minutes um, to move on to the types of patients that we see then. So I see these types of patients on a daily basis. And I think you probably shake out into three types of patients that you see who lack capacity. They obviously, they either have pathological agitation so they have a disease process going on that's causing them to be agitated and something like a central nervous system infection like meningitis or encephalitis are the two that would spring immediately to mind but electrolyte abnormalities hyponatremia hyponatremia can also cause pathological <coughs> agitation and one of our key jobs is to decide whether or not acute behavioral disturbance in the emergency department has a triggered uh, has a medical uh, disease that's triggering it we might see an acute psychosis, which is related to a formal um, psychiatric disorder. And then we might just see people who um, are a behavioral challenge. So I think your job, if you had to put it into a nutshell, is to work out which one of these three you have in front of you, apply the correct legislation if you need to, use the correct treatment, be that psychiatric treatment or medical treatment or another form of treatment, um, and try not to end up in jail yourself, because that's an awful lot of paperwork for your uh, on-call consultant. So we briefly talked about pathological causes. That's pretty much all I'm going to say about that. Remember that acute behavioural disturbance, the number one thing that we need to exclude as clinicians is do they have a medical illness that we can fix, in particular head injuries, um, CNS infection, drug and alcohol toxidromes. So we can fix those, and that's actually quite important to recognise. Have the picture of the psychiatric, psychotic patient in front of you. Um, they all look similar, actually. They don't look the same as a pathologically agitated patient. They have a different presentation. It's unusual that this is the first presentation of a psychiatric disorder. It's often with a patient who is known to have a mental health disorder already. So it's unusual to make that as the new diagnosis. 
They'll often have typical speech patterns, so they'll have pressured speech, flight of ideas, word, sal word salad, all the things that we read about in the books and all the things that are very striking when we come across these patients. A good tip of differentiating between pathological and psychotic agitation is that the hallucinations tend to be auditory, so they tend to be hearing voices rather than seeing things. So visual hallucinations tend to have an organic cause rather than a psychotic cause. And psychosis is really defined by a loss of contact with reality, and it's that that's the striking feature. The patients who are sick with meningitis and cephalitis just don't seem to be there. They're just, they're, just, they're just not quite there. They're there, but they're not there. The psychotic patients in front of you are in a totally different reality. They're responding to different things around you. And it's a striking difference between those two patients, which is why when you've seen them, lock that picture into your head so you can pattern recognize next time. And it's a different group of patients to those with antisocial behavior um, and behavioral disturbance. And I'm quite clear that we need to respond effectively to all of these patients. Um, treating the acutely unwell and the acutely psychotic patients, but also having um, a very low threshold for escalation of um, um, response to antisocial behavior, particularly in the context of healthcare practitioners. So my approach to this disturbed patient, regardless of which group they're in actually, if they need medical treatment, if they're unconscious, I treat them in their best interests. And if they have capacity, I comply with their wishes, unless they've been put under a section of the Mental Health Act, which might allow me to do some other things. And if they're not unconscious and they don't have capacity, I can use the Mental Capacity Act to facilitate my treatment. And I might need, to use some very good communication skills. I might need to use some pharmacotherapy to sedate that patient in order to enact my least restrictive plan. Or I might need to get the police to help me restrain that patient in their best interests in order to perhaps gain control with pharmacotherapy. And I think in that patient who's in front of you that you're trying to work out if they're in group one, two or three, the key question really is, is this a medical problem? Is this a psychiatric problem? Or is this a behavioral problem? It's another way of putting those patients into groups, into the same groups. And I don't think that in this group of patients who's right in front of you, there's no formal stepwise approach to assessing capacity. It's a judgment call. Yes, you have to ask yourself those four questions about receiving information, retaining it, weighing it up and communicating it back to you. But nobody will be able to tell you, this is what I do every single time in order to come to that decision. It ultimately is a judgment call. And sometimes you'll get it right, sometimes you'll get it wrong, but you have to be thinking about the right things. And unfortunately, we're not really allowed to subscribe to the Nick Fury School of Capacity Assessment uh, as much as we would like to sometimes. So that patient who's genuinely agitated in front of you, how do you gain control of them? How do you gain control for your safety, for your staff's safety and for their safety? Well, we've talked already about that escalation of communicating with the patient, maybe using pharmacological restraints with intramuscular or intravenous benzodiazepines, antipsychotic medications. And we've talked about police assistance and actually using the police to enact your least restrictive plan, holding the patient down so that you can put a cannula in is entirely reasonable. The police are trained to restrain people in a safe way. So I don't really, I think the days are gone of, you know, everybody in A&E piling on top of this patient, you know, the nurses, the doctors, the porters piling on top of this patient while you try and get a line in. You know, we have police, we have security who are trained in um, the least restrictive and safest way for that patient of restraining them so they're not hurting themselves and they can facilitate you getting that line in to give the benzodiazepine. And remember every time that we've got to do the least restrictive option, we've got to do the minimum we can to safely progress the patient to the next stage of care. And it's important, particularly in the days of body-worn video cameras, both on the security teams and on the police, 
that you're very clear that you're using the Mental Capacity Act, so that this patient does not have the capacity to consent to the next bit of treatment, uh, and therefore I'm detaining him under the Mental Capacity Act, or I'm treating him under the Mental Capacity Act. So gaining control, if you don't think that they've got a direct result, behaviour is a direct result of illness, trauma, psychosis, Communicating that to the police is actually quite important. And I think unleashing the police is actually a genuine method of controlling this group of patients. Going through that process, assessing to the best of your ability that there's no medical issue, there's no psychiatric issue here, I'm now stepping back and I'm giving you, the police, permission to engage with social control. And I think it's quite important that we do have a zero tolerance to assaults on members of staff. I was on duty in the emergency department um, last night and one of my nursing staff was physically assaulted by a patient who was in probably the latter category of, um, uh, of that group of patients with a pure behavioural problem, not a, provoked by a psychiatric disorder, not provoked by a, a physical disorder, but had assaulted a member of my staff. And I think that the NHS should and does have a zero tolerance to that. And we should just engage with the police and have that patient removed. And just a very quick note on what to do if things go wrong. Uh, there are always top cover. There's always on-call legal advice. You probably, through your various um, um, professional organisations, either GMC or HCPC, um, have access to people like the Medical Protection Society of the Medical Defence Union. Um, and they will help you both during, during the acute incident um, and also afterwards in the event of um, a litigation claim for any of this stuff. And we absolutely, of course, do not want to end up going to jail for this, uh, and neither should we. So just to summarise that, and I'm sorry we, uh, we ran on a bit, um, Assessment capacity is a key principle. Uh, it's embedded and enshrined in statutes that you have to be um, familiar with. Um, work out if medical care is needed or if the cells are needed. And I think that the more I do this, the more I think that's a really key distinction to make. Um, deprivation of liberty is a big deal, but if you do it for the right reasons and for the shortest amount of time possible, um, people will always be sympathetic to that, that you're trying to act in your patient's best interests. Remember the proportional response and the least restrictive option. Um, work closely with your police and security colleagues and call for help and advice uh, whenever you can. And with that, I will take any questions or just say thank you. Yes, hi, do you want to just wait? Um, I've got the, uh, the mic coming. <laughs> one of your slides almost a, a stepwise in terms of communication, uh, pharmacological restraint and then uh, physical police restraint. Is that sort of the way you would see that working in practice? I think so. I think in general, um, the reason that I didn't put physical restraint um, to facilitate pharmacological restraint is that sometimes you can talk patients into taking a sedative because sometimes they have just enough uh, contact with reality to know that they need help. Um, you know, can I just give you something to chill you out? Can I give you an injection just to chill you out so we can have a proper chat? Um, and you can sometimes talk them into that sed uh, sedative restraint um, or at least the sedative to take the edge off so that you can then proceed to the next stage of care. The patients that are totally off the wall, it probably flips so that uh, the police restraint to facilitate getting the intramuscular injection in or getting the cannula in to titrate your benzodiazepines up uh, is probably quite important. And some of that depends a little bit on um, the size of the patient, the presentation, you know, the, the patient that's taking cocaine and has a, an excited delirium who's got a temperature of 40 degrees, they're flailing around all over the place, they spend the days in the gym, the rugby player, you know, they're not going to let you anywhere near them without police pinning them down to get a needle into them. So you do have to sometimes flip the, the physical restraint and the pharmacological restraint. But ideally, on the basis of least restrictive option, it will be, have a nice chat, can I calm you down? If not, would you mind taking a tablet for me? Or can I give you an injection just to take the edge off? If not, 
escalate to hold them down and, and deliver that if you think it's in their best interests. Anyone else in the audience? Anything online? Nothing online. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for coming. Thanks for the live stream. Um, the next um, forum is next month on the 26th of March, and that is your um, online sign-in um, and um, CPD certificate form. Um, I've reduced the form. It's only like two or three clicks now, and then you just get a, a link with your certificate that you can download. So we appreciate your feedback and hopefully we'll see you next month. Thank you very much.